And uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Kevin, for that excellent, wonderful introduction, some of which were, you know, slightly embellished, but that's how most introductions go. Um, the part that I take credit for, though, is the awesome Haley. And if, if you know, you don't hear anything else, you know, I think that uh, Haley is super awesome and uh, she's been instrumental in a lot of what we're going to talk about. And uh, while I wait for some more people to come in, um, first I want to talk about the emergency department. You know, this is what it looks like. Has any one of you been to the emergency department before? Yeah, it, it looks like that. It looks like that we see patients everywhere in the waiting room, in the hallways, but never in the bathroom. We don't do that. Um, and, and that's really important because um, most of the decisions that we make are time sensitive. And, uh, and part of the reason I show this picture also is that we're usually faced with information overload. Um, so it's not unusual that I am taking care of you know, a cardiac arrest patient, and then a nurse comes in and sticks an EKG in front of me for a chest pain patient, because those EKGs have to be reviewed within five minutes of being obtained. And so, you know, I'm running a cardiac arrest, someone is uh, sticking an EKG in front of me, and then, uh, you know, I may get a call in almost at the same time about, you know, a transfer of patients who is going to come in, or there may be another patient next door who is critically ill. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we typically, you know, have a ton of information overload. And, uh, and with every passing year, there are new diagnostic tests. And, uh, and, and so, you know, there's a lot of information coming from all those different sources as well. So being able to um, drill down knowledge and information from all those varied data sources is critically important. And I think that that's where um, you all fit in. And, uh, and I'm hoping that, you know, as, as I talk, um, you begin to uh, sort of have ideas about how you can help us be more successful um, in taking care of traumatic brain injury patients. So I want to tell you about how we take care of traumatic brain injury patients. And first of all, I'm going to say that um, there's a huge burden of traumatic brain injury evaluations in the emergency department. Um, but our current evaluation is inefficient. And uh, it's also overly optimistic. So every year uh, in the United States, we see almost 5 million ED visits for traumatic brain injury, 5 million. And out of that 5 million, about 2.5 million are actually diagnosed with traumatic brain injury. Um, and these are, the, these are only patients who come to the emergency department for traumatic brain injury. There are tons of people with traumatic brain injury who uh, never seek medical care. Um, the majority of patients who come in with traumatic brain injury or suspect a traumatic brain injury get a CAT scan. Now, the CAT scan is horrible. Um, it's a lot of money, yes, and uh, it doesn't tell you a whole lot. So what the CAT scan does is it tells you if you're bleeding in the brain, period. Sometimes, you know, you can see some signs of axonal injury, uh, but the brain is made up of a whole lot of cells that are not blood cells. And so if you damage you know, neurons and axons and exercises, you know, those usually don't show up on the CAT scan. Um, and although we get CAT scans on 80% of this four and a half or almost five million patients, only 10% of those CAT scans produce information that we can use. Only 10% of those CAT scans are positive. So the majority of CAT scans are actually negative and uninformative. Um, so you're going to see um, these four letters, G-O-S-E. The G-O-S-E is a scale we use for, uh, for measuring clinical outcomes in traumatic brain injury. Uh, and uh, it was developed in Glasgow. And uh, one is equivalent to death. And eight is that you're back to your functional baseline. And so you're going to see this a whole lot, and I just want to orient you in terms of you know, what the GOSE is. And uh, we have a number of different ways for categorizing the GOSE. Uh, one of the usual cutoffs is four or less. And for a GOSE of four means that you, know, you are at home um, and you can exist by yourself at home, but you can't get out of the house by yourself. You know, if you need to go shopping or go out of the house, you're going to need help. 
Um, and typically, if someone uh, after TBI is not able to go out and uh, shop independently and uh, do activities of daily living independently, uh, then we say they have a bad outcome. Because we're hoping that you know we can get people to the point where even if they need help with someone around, they can at least go out and uh, be independent. Um, so you know we did a study uh, called the Head Smart Study, um, where we examined patients who came to the emergency department with traumatic brain injury, and about half of the cohort um, had a GOSE of less than eight um, at three months. Less than eight means you're not back to your full your baseline mental status, and that uh, you know you probably are still having headaches, you're having difficulty concentration with concentration, difficulty with sleep, and so on. Um, and uh, and when the patients came to the emergency department, I asked the ER physician, you know, this person in front of you, what are the chances that they are going to uh, still have symptoms at three months? How accurate do you think the ER physicians were? Any guesses? So, you know, someone comes in with head injury, and then uh, we ask them on the day of injury, do you think the person you're seeing now is going to keep on having symptoms at three months? Not very accurate. Yeah, 20%. So we, our emergency physicians were very optimistic. And they pretty much thought that everybody was going to be fine. And they said only 4% of patients were not going to be fine. Um, and part of the issue is that we currently classify traumatic brain injury as mild moderate or severe, so bad. Tell someone who um, used to be able to go to work that because they are not comatose, we're calling them mild. But they can't go to work or they can't go to school uh, because they are having headaches and they are having difficulty concentrating. And I remember this one patient who said she was a public school of public health student at Hopkins. And she said, you know, I'll go into the bathroom, I'll shower shampoo my hair, and then forget that I shampooed my hair and do it all over again. Or talk to someone on the phone and don't realize that I just talked to that person. But we call those people mild, um, which you know, does a huge disservice you know, to those people. So essentially, my point is you know, we do a really bad job of diagnosing traumatic brain injury. Now, and when it comes to clinical trials for traumatic brain injury, here's what we do. So, Although we, call, we have one term, traumatic brain injury, um, there are different subtypes of traumatic brain injury. You can have a contusion, you can have hematoma, you can have cerebral swelling, you can have diffuse axonal injury. There are a number of different subtypes of traumatic brain injury. Here's what we do when we do clinical trials. We put everyone in the same basket. And so you know, these are you know, some studies that uh, have been done in traumatic brain injury, and all of them have failed. You know, all these studies have been negative. People come up with a new drug, they test it, and it shows that it doesn't work in traumatic brain injury. Why is that? It's because we're acting like we're treating cancer. Can you imagine doing a clinical trial where you say, you know, I have a drug for cancer, and so I'm going to treat everyone the same? I'll treat breast cancer and prostate cancer and lung cancer all the same. That's what we're doing to traumatic brain injury. Um, and, uh, and, and no wonder the treatments are not working. You know, it's because you know, we're lumping everyone in the same basket and treating them all the same. So it's not about equality. It's more about equity. That, that also in these clinical trials, you know, we treat everyone equally, which should not be the case. There are some patients who are going to need more of the dose of a certain drug, right? Um, you may have someone who has a more severe injury, and so they may need 20 milligrams of a particular drug, as opposed to someone else, you know, who has less severe injury or smaller body size, you know, who needs a smaller dose of that drug. Uh, but we currently, you know, treat everyone the same. We give the same doses to patients, and we do not have a good way for monitoring how well patients are responding to the various treatments we give them. So uh, we're essentially driving blind 
And typically, I show a video about driving blind, but that's essentially what we do, um, that um, we, without paying attention to you know, the different subtypes of patients, you know, we lump them all in the same basket, we give them the same treatment, we have no way of monitoring the treatments to titrate treatment according to, to uh, the effect of individual patients. And then uh, when the trials fail, you know, we question you know, why this is happening. So this is my conceptual framework. This is sort of how I view the world of traumatic brain injury. That initially, there is the primary brain injury. We can't do anything about that. You know, primary brain injury is where you know, you've damaged some brain cells. Um, and uh, sort of is the mechanical impact. And the only way that can be prevented will be you know, through public health campaigns and you know, wear helmets and wear seat belts and so on. Um, so I can't do a whole lot about primary brain injury. Um, then there are the pre-injury factors that I can't do a whole lot about either. Um, we know that the more educated you are, the better your outcome is going to be if you have traumatic brain injury. So stay in school, keep on studying. Um, we also do know that people with uh, pre-morbid um, psychiatric problems um, tend to have a harder time with recovering from traumatic brain injury. And so these are you know, pre-morbid uh, conditions that we can't do anything about. Here's what I can do something about, secondary brain injury. So after the primary brain injury, there is secondary brain injury. And the secondary brain injury is caused by a number of different things. Uh, one is cerebral hypoxia which essentially means um, low oxygen levels um, in the brain. So you know, the brain um, is a highly metabolic organ that uh, uses a lot of um, energy. And, uh, and if your oxygen levels are low in the brain, um, you're not going to be able to uh, perform the functions that are necessary. The next um, important thing is uh, decreased cerebral perfusion, which means you have low blood flow going to the brain. Um, and uh, and these, are the two, these are the two main areas where you know, we try to intervene. Um, some of the causes of cerebral hypoxia or decreased oxygen level in the brain are things like poor oxygenation. So the traumatic brain injury patient may also have lung injury, and so they're not getting enough oxygen. Um, poor ventilation, which um, speaks more to the carbon dioxide levels, that you know, they are not breathing well and exchanging gas as well. And if you have a high uh, CO2 level, that can cause constriction of the blood vessels. And so parts of the brain will not get enough blood flow. Um, there's also low hemoglobin. If you're, you know, trauma patients can lose a lot of blood. And so the low hemoglobin can also cause, you know, um, decreased amount of oxygen in the brain. And then you can also have increased metabolic rate. And uh, that sometimes can happen when you have a seizure. You know, some traumatic brain injury patients have seizures. Um, and uh, some of them also have infections. And uh, all that stuff can increase the metabolic demand um, and uh, lead to cerebral hypoxia. There is also um, decreased blood flow to the brain, which is you know, cerebral, uh, decreased cerebral perfusion. That can happen from systemic hypotension. So you know, the brain injury patient has a liver, liver injury as well and is bleeding in their belly. So their blood pressure is low. And so they're not getting enough blood to the brain. And that's causing additional brain injury on top of the primary brain injury they already had. Um, and, uh, and then this other one is also a really important, increased intracranial pressure. So whenever you have injury to the brain, uh, the brain usually swells. And uh, the pressure in the brain goes up. And if the pressure in the brain is up, uh, you need higher blood pressure to be able to get more blood into the brain. And, uh, and so essentially, the equation for cerebral perfusion pressure is you know, your systemic arterial pressure minus your intracranial pressure. Um, and the higher the intracranial pressure goes, you know, the lower um, your cerebral perfusion pressure is. Um, and so these are the areas that you know, we can intervene on. Um, these are the things that we can do to prevent secondary brain injury. But how do we measure secondary brain injury? We have no tools. There's really just no good way to measure secondary brain injury. You know, there are some new diagnostics that I will talk about like, that allow you to measure things like brain tissue oxygen. 
and that allow you to measure cerebral perfusion pressure. But all of those have limitations. My hypothesis is that it's all in the blood, that we have lots of things that we can measure in the blood. We can measure proteins, we can measure metabolites, we can me measure RNA, and, uh, and by looking at you know, these analytes in blood and looking at how they change over time, uh, we will be able to better monitor secondary brain injury. And so if, if you don't hear anything else in this lecture, you know, that's the one thing I want you to remember, that you know, my main premise is that it is in the blood, that um, by measuring analytes in the blood and by measuring you know, how those analytes change over time, uh, we can get a good sense of uh, secondary brain injury. So I'm not just making this up, um, that we already have evidence that there are some proteins that you can measure in blood that can give you a sense of what's happening in the brain. So this year, we had two blood tests that were approved by the FDA for traumatic brain injury. Um, they are GFAP and ECHL1. So GFAP, gliofibrillary acidic protein, it's a structural protein found in astrocytes. And essentially, it's released anytime you have damage to brain cells. And UCHL1 is an enzyme that's found in neuronal cell bodies. And again, anytime you know, the cells die, they release uh, this enzyme. And that's what we've been measuring. And so a study was done um, just this year called the ALERT TBI trial um, that looked at 1,780 patients. And I'm going to walk you through this table. Uh, and so they, uh, there were 107 of them had a positive CT scan. I told you that majority of the CT scans are usually negative. Um, so in this group, 1673 patients had negative CT scan. Um, and a negative CT scan, though, doesn't mean they didn't have TBI. It just means they were not bleeding in their brain. Now, this test is really good in that uh, out of the 107 people who had a positive CT, the test was able to pick 104 and missed three. And those three that were missed, you know, were actually one of them, you know, even though they had a positive CT scan, when they did an MRI, uh, the MRI was negative. And the other two had tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of bleeding um, in the brain, which, you know, they didn't do anything about anyway. Uh, so, and you know, the negative predictive value is actually also pretty good. And uh, so, this 668 people are people who did not have a, uh, a positive CT scan, and they also had a negative test using this blood test. So, these are actually CT scans that can be avoided, uh, the 668 people. Um, so, first point, you know, that GFAP and ECHL1 are good blood tests for identifying you know, those who are going to have a positive CT scan. Um, and then using you know, data from one of the studies I've been working on called the TRAC TBI cohort. And I won't bother you with all the details, but essentially TRAC TBI um, is a multi-center study um, that enrolls TBI patients across uh, the country and uh, follows them um, for the clinical outcome. And, uh, and based on this one blood test, GFAP, um, and looking at the data, we can categorize the GFAP values into three zones. There is a zone of people with super low levels. And uh, these are people who do not need a CT scan, and they're not going to need surgery. So essentially, you know, even though they may have TBI, um, their levels are so low that you don't even have to worry about getting a CT scan in these people. And then they are the middle zone people who need a CT scan, but they're probably not going to need surgery. And so if for the military, for example, you know, these people in both the green and the red and the yellow zones are people who do not necessarily need to be evacuated from the field because it's really unlikely they're going to need surgery. And then there are people in this red zone who are people with the highest GFAP levels. And then those are people who absolutely need a CT scan 
and most likely are going to need some sort of surgical intervention. So, you know, the data is unfolding. I mean, we're not using these tests clinically yet, but we're slowly building um, the database. And uh, the takeaway is that um, these blood tests are really good, A, for identifying those who have bleeds in the brain, and then also B, for risk stratifying people, trying to figure out who is super sick versus who is not that sick. So this is another study that I'm hoping to submit for publication either tonight or tomorrow, um, where we're looking at uh, 900, I'm sorry. Yeah. Crudely, yes. Um, yes, um, you know, because, and I guess with the next slide, I'll show you that, so the mild, moderate, and severe is based on the GCS. So GCS is the Glasgow Coma Scale, and it's such a so yeah, it is related, um, but the blood tests do a little bit better than GCS, which is what uh, the next slide is going to talk about. Um, so we uh, we looked at 946 patients, and uh, we looked at uh, five different proteins here. Okay, um, so the proteins are GFAP, CHL1. There are a couple more proteins we looked at: S100B, NSE, and high sensitivity CRP. So again, you know. What did I just do? Um, okay. All right, it's back. Okay. Just to get everyone. Oh, it's gone again. It's back. Okay. All right. So, um, we for each protein, you know, we divided the values into quintiles, um, and uh, and. The y-axis is, you remember the GOSE, um, and four or less is that, you know, you can't uh, operate independently outside your home. So um, these are the number of people who didn't do well, essentially. Um, and uh, as you can see, for most of these proteins, you know, those who were in the highest quintile, um, they did not do well at all compared to those with in the lowest quintile. Um, and uh, and especially the first three, this, this, and that, uh, you know, you can really distinguish between those who did well versus those who did not do well. Um, these two didn't work out so well. Um, now, how many of you are familiar with the area under the receive operator cap? Awesome. Okay. So um, GCS, like I said, is what we use now. Um, it, it's based on, you know, whether the patient is talking, if their eyes are open, and uh, if they are moving, you know, their extremities. So you don't have to do any tests, any blood tests, you don't have to pay any money. Um, this is based on a clinical exam. And how well the clinical exam does right now, um, the AUC is 0.63. When we added um, these two proteins to the AUC, to the biomarker, or to the GCS, the AUC went up to 0.853. Um, and uh, typically, you know, an AEC of 0.9 or greater is like excellent. Um, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, it's good. And less than that, you know, it's probably not clinically useful. Um, so this is good. This is good. And not too many biomarkers are able to do this. Yes. What is the gold standard? Um, so that's the GOSE. That's uh, that's the scale where you know we ask people how well they're doing and see if they're able to uh, operate functionally um, at home or not. Um, the scale of one to eight, sitting in. Yeah, so this was measured actually six months afterward. Um, so essentially, these are people who didn't do well at six months after injury. And these blood tests were obtained on the day of injury. So it's pretty powerful that on the day you come in, I can tell you how well you're going to do in six months. Um, so we also, and this is sort of where I'm going to need your help a whole lot, is that uh, we also look to see whether we can follow these biomarkers over time and, uh, and whether these markers can tell us how well a patient is doing and how well they are responding to treatment. And so we worked with uh, Dr. Alam's lab. Dr. Alam is the chief of trauma surgery. And uh, he has some pigs 
that uh, that are TBI models. So they essentially um, hit the pigs in the head, they give them TBI, and then um, they uh, monitor them over time. And uh, they decided to test uh, a, a drug called valproic acid. And so this is the group that received the test drug, valproic acid. These are the people who just received normal saline, which is essentially just water. Um, and so we measured um, the levels of GFAP, which is the protein I've been talking about, over time. Um, the time scale is from zero hours to 10 days. Um, who can tell me the difference in the two graphs for VPA versus normal saline? Any takers? Anyone shout it out? What's the difference in the in GFAP levels between those who got water only versus those who got the experimental drug? Come on. Yes. 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 Essentially, that you know the the levels in the biomarkers. Um, now, in this particular biomarker, was a lot lower in uh, those who got VPA compared to those who got normal saline. Now, if I tell you that this biomarker is measuring cell death, because this biomarker uh, is a structural protein that sits inside you know, the astrocytes, and it only released when astrocytes die. Um, so if some animals are having lower levels of this marker, uh, what does that suggest? Anyone? Less salsa dying, yes. Um, well, we wrote a published paper with a lot. And, um, you know, what we showed was that um, when VPA is treated to the pigs, uh, neuro V1 is dead, and neuronal uh, proliferation goes way up, and real cell proliferation goes way down. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, these are, this is actually an astrocytic marker. Um, and, uh, yep, and then the lesion size also went down. So, so the blood is actually showing exactly the same thing. And, uh, and so we, uh, we think that, you know, we can actually monitor how well people are doing by looking in their blood and telling um, how much brain cell death is going on. We looked at a second protein called neuroflamin like chain, and this is an axonal protein. Um, and uh, we saw the same thing, that uh, the levels of this marker uh, were lower um, in people receiving, the animals receiving <coughs> VPA compared to those not receiving VPA. And, uh, and essentially, um, this is sort of where we're going uh, with this line of work that, uh, that not only are we interested in measuring on the day of injury what's happening, but we can follow patients over time and uh, get a sense of if they're doing well or not. Right now, when we do clinical trials, what happens is that we have to wait till six months to be able to tell if a drug is working or not. But with this, you know, we should be able to tell um, over t in a shorter time period whether you know your drug is actually causing less brain cell death or not and uh, but it's not just these proteins um, metabolites can tell us something as well and uh, not just metabolites but RNAs uh, can tell us um, prognostic information as well and the challenge with monitoring over time is that you start having a whole lot of data. And remember the first picture I showed you about the emergency physician who is taking care of you know, a ton of different patients and has this information overload? It is going to be really hard to decipher you know, what to do you know, with all this continuous data biomarker. And, uh, and, and so we need you know, novel techniques um, to be able to make sense out of these longitudinal um, data. And especially, you know, to see how the different proteins change in relationship to each other. Remember the slide where I showed you five different proteins, and three of them um, were actually 
um, associated with the outcome. Um, you know, there are a number of different proteins that can be looked at, uh, but we have to understand, you know, how they're changing individually and how they're changing with respect to each other. And, uh, and that's sort of the challenge we have, um, and that's something that, you know, we could use your help uh, with solving. So that's what Alan is doing um, as the next phase. Um, and so they've started um, a phase two trial uh, with VPA. And, uh, you know, for my part, you know, I'm not as interested in VPA. I am more interested in being able to monitor how well patients are responding, regardless of the treatment they're receiving. Yeah. Yeah. Which he's he's actually also tested. You know, he's looking at some HDAC specific uh, inhibitors as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 awesome. Um, I want to tell you about you know some of our ongoing projects. You know, where we're going to have a ton of data, and we'll know what to do with. Uh, one of them is Boost Three trial. Uh, so Boost Three just got funded by the NINDS. And uh, BOOST 3 essentially stands for Brain Oxygen Optimization in Severe TBI. Um, and uh, so uh, what's happening in BOOST 3 is that uh, we're going to enroll a little over 1,000 patients. Uh, and uh, patients are going to be randomized to either ICP monitoring only. What I mean by that is they put a probe in their brain to measure the pressure. You remember I told you perfusion was important? Um, so they put a brain in to measure the pressure and they direct treatment based on uh, pressure monitoring. Um, so you're not going blind, you're going based off of what you can measure. And then some people are gonna get both ICP monitoring and partial brain tissue oxygen monitoring. Now this is what partial brain tissue oxygen monitoring looks like. So they drill a hole, drill a skull, and uh, put a probe in a normal part of the brain. And that probe measures the oxygen level um, at about a two centimeter radius um, and, uh, and gives you a value. And uh, usually, you don't want anything less than 20. So, so the treatment you know, will be targeted towards uh, getting that level higher than 20. So some patients are going to get only ICP monitoring. Some patients are going to get ICP and brain tissue oxygen monitoring. And then we're going to see which patients are going to do better. Thank you. Yes, yes. Which is why blood tests are going to be better, and uh, and that's that's my whole point with that. That what that probe does is they put it in normal brain tissue. So you have traumatic brain injury. You have one area of the brain that is like all messed up, for lack of a better scientific word. Um, and uh, and then you have the good part of your brain. Um, and the probe is going to be placed in the good part of the brain. Um, and the probe is going to measure a small radius around the tip of the probe. And it does so happen that, you know, if you've had severe traumatic brain injury, um, there's also spasming of blood vessels. And so even the, the good areas can still have decreased blood flow. But you can't tell me that for sure, you know, if the normal brain areas, oxygen is fine. It uh, doesn't really tell me that the injured brain area is, area is fine as well. And this is why I think that the biomarkers are going to do even better than this tool. Because with biomarkers, as I've shown you already, I can tell you how many brain cells are actually dying. Um, and I can sort of measure you know, the global amount of uh, brain cell death. So we're in the process of submitting um, an application called BioBoost, where for patients enrolled in this funded trial, you know, we're going to get blood samples, and we're going to get um, longitudinal sampling. Um, we do every three, uh, every eight hours on the first two days, and then twice a day for the next seven days, and then continue getting samples up to six months out. Um, and uh, and so we're going to have a ton of data, um, and because we have blood, you know, we should be able to measure all kinds of proteins. And you know other analytes uh, in these 
and yes, we'll be doing all of that as well. Yeah, so um, um, the boost um, is going to use exception from informed consent. The parent study is going to use exception from informed consent, where you know it's it's a whole process where you do uh, community consultations and you know you tell you speak to, yes yeah so this is but this particular study is exception from informed consent yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I would say though that for BioBoost, which is the biomarker portion of the study, uh, we are going to get consent, and we're going to get consent from the legally authorized representatives. Um, so we will. Our current plan is that we will draw the we'll draw the initial sample, we will hold it, we'll look for a family member. If we can find a family member, you know, then we will do the additional sampling. Um, if we can't find a family member, then we will discard the initial sample. We just don't want to miss that initial sample, so we're going to get it regardless. And Haley knows we've done this in other studies. Yeah, this is all severe TBI. This is all severe TBI. All severe. All GCS 328. So, yes, they can consent and, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all severe TBI patients, um, and uh, and yes, there's a whole process for doing an exception from informed consent study. Uh, matter of fact, we had gone to the DoD asking for funding for BioBoost. They didn't fund us because they they don't fund exception from informed consent study. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I know I'm. Okay. There's another study that yeah. I'm working on uh, where we're actively enrolling patients now. Um, it's called the hyperbaric oxygen in brain injury treatment trial, where essentially uh, we put people in a chamber um, um, with compressed oxygen. As I told you um, earlier on, um, hypoxia you know, can be one of the causes of secondary brain injury. And so the hypothesis here is that if we give you a ton of oxygen under pressure, you know, we're going to be able to get a whole lot more oxygen to the diseased brain cells, and hopefully people can get better. So people are randomized to different doses of these, this oxygen versus, you know, standard of care where, you know, you just get regular oxygen, and we're following people to see uh, who's going to get better. Um, and uh, we're looking for funds right now to actually uh, collect blood samples in these patients as well, um, so we can be able to test, you know, whether... Um, this treatment is actually causing a decrease in brain cell death uh, based on blood samples. The last study that I want to talk about is a study that uh, Haley is intimately familiar with, and she's enrolled all 20 subjects that we have in the study right now. Um, and uh, we call it Optima um, TBI pilot. One of the things you're going to notice is that uh, for any clinical trial to be successful, you have to have a cool name. So if any of you is interested in doing clinical trials, you got to work on a mnemonic. Um, in this study, uh, what we do is uh, we randomize more of the mild TBI patients. Again, I hate that word mild, but these are the non-comatose TBI patients. Uh, we give them 6 grams of fish oil per day uh, for one month, and then 1.2 grams of fish oil per day um, for two additional months. Um, and uh, for uh, you, you get randomized to either that or to placebo, uh, which is olive oil uh, for three months. And you know the pills look pretty similar, I guess apart from if you break them or if you burp um, after taking them and you know you smell the, the fish oil. Um, we follow um, these people for we get blood samples when they come in, and then at two weeks, at one month, and at three months. And uh, you know we're going to look to see if uh, the levels of these um, biomarkers of brain injury change over time. So we have 20 patients now, and you know we're hoping to add a few more before we start analyzing the sample. That's an exclusion. Yeah, it's an exclusion criteria. Yeah, you can tell them how many times you've uh, 
run to the ED and uh, we got excited and then fish on some fish oil so we couldn't enroll them. Yeah, um, it, the challenge is that uh, yeah, you need you need a lot of a lot of people um, who've been on that uh, to be able to answer that question. Um, so I think yeah, that would be a good good question to answer down the line. One of the things that we're also doing is that uh, uh, we're collecting red blood cells, and so you know everyone has like a DHA intake, right? And so we're gonna get the red blood cell DHA intake, and we can know exactly sort of what the baseline is. Uh, and uh, see whether those with low baseline do better you know, than those who are already saturated. So great question. Um, and, uh, and so we, we're working with some engineers to uh, come up with a way where we can uh, monitor the levels of these blood biomarkers in essentially a continuous fashion. Um, and then you know, hopefully beam the results to like an iPhone or to a monitor. Uh, but again, you know, these are going to pose analytical challenges because you know the more frequently you measure things and uh, the more values you have uh, the greater the need um, for advanced analytics um, that would be able to give clinicians you know some sort of decision support and uh, some sort of binary decision making um, and uh, there are a ton of people you know who've helped um, to make this possible and uh, I thank them all um, and I'll pause for questions Seeing that GFAP was astrocytic in, na in nature, uh, and yes, I, I understand that blood samples are easier to draw, but are you seeing any of these biomarkers in CSF? Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, and for all the studies, yes, we are, we are collecting CSF as well. And uh, a lot of severe TBI patients you know, have um, drains in the brain, um, so it makes it easier to uh, collect CSF in them. But um, so-called milder patients, you know, usually, uh, don't have any of those drains, and so it limits the applicability you know, in the mild patients, but for sure in the severe patients. Uh, and, and I do think that um, at least the initial data suggests that the CSF values are more accurate than blood, you know, which is to be expected. Yes? Have you um, looked at all at variation in where the injury occurs within the brain and whether that affects the GFAP levels in the bloodstream? Yes, um, that is um, something that uh, we're planning to do, um, but haven't done yet. Um, so track TBI um, enrolled a total of 2,700 TBI patients. We've analyzed samples in the first 1,375. Um, to be able to do effectively do subgroup analyses like that, you need more N. Um, and I actually question whether we're going to be able to even do that analysis with 2,700 patients because the challenge is um, a lot of people have a lot of different things going on, right? You don't just have you know, one area of the brain damage. You usually have three or four areas of the brain damage. So again, you know, this is the opportunity for, for you guys to, to, to help out. Kvan has you know, an algorithm um, for being able to uh, automatically uh, um, quantify uh, lesion size and lesion location. And again, as you know, all these studies and role patients, uh, the, NI, the NIH um, and other funding agencies are requiring that for all of these major trials that are going on, all of the data needs to be put in a particular warehouse. And uh, about a year or two after the end of the study, everyone can have access to it. So, um, you know, as you plot your career going forward, I mean, these are going to be databases that are available to you. The images, the blood test results, and the clinical data, they're all going to be available to you. So just to follow up on that, um, the reason I was asking about that is recently um, found that there is a population of astrocytes in the brain that's located in two different regions that actually express GFAP under normal circumstances. So it might be really interesting to try to see if... Uh, Maybe the, the reason why this biomarker um, shows up in some cases is because the, the astrocytes, like on the outside of the brain, are, are so damaged. they express GFAP in normal circumstances. Yeah, so we can chat afterwards. Yeah. But um, 
basically we found that there's a thin layer of astrocytes expressing GFAP on the outside of the oh, on the outside because yeah. they all have it in the inside right. um, but they may have it on the outside as well yeah right. which so maybe those with injuries to the, that area they have even higher levels than those without injury to that area is that exactly. the hypothesis maybe yeah yeah, yeah. So when you, in, when you injure the brain, you know, the astrocytes kind of come in and infiltrate and create that protective layer. That's probably what you're talking about. That'd be a gold mine. Yeah. Yeah, good, good thinking, John. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, I would like to thank our speaker once again. It was wonderful, and we enjoy your talk. Thank you. Thank you.